All right, so question, question number one. What part of the government is supposed to make new laws? Do you remember who makes the laws, who enforces the laws, who judges the laws, which branch? Judicial, they judge the laws or, or adjudicate or whatever term you wanna use, right? They, some people say interpret the laws. So the judicial branch is supposed to, I'll use interpret, meaning when they create a law and then there's some question as to whether or not the, the law meant this or whatever, interpret, okay. Who creates laws? The legislative branch, right? Which is the Congress for federal law. So the House of Representatives and the Senate, they create new laws. So legislative, and then what's the executive branch do? They enforce the laws, right? So they they execute the law. They don't, ex I mean, I, I guess they execute criminals too, but we don't mean it in that sense, like killing the law. It means they make sure it happens, right? They, they enforce the law. So that's what the three branches of government do in, in really, really broad terms. So then we have these weird entities called administrative agencies that are non-legislative, meaning they're not supposed to make laws, and they're non-judicial, meaning they're not supposed to interpret laws, so they must be executive in nature, but they make, interpret, and enforce regulations that in essence have the force of law. So that sounds like a lot of power, especially when the whole reason the government was separated into three branches was to limit the amount of power any one branch of the government could have. And now we have these entities that seem to have all of the power. So I'll give you an example of, um, of an executive or an administrative agency. Sometimes you'll hear them called executive agencies as well. Think of someone like the, um, I don't know, the Department of Energy for the United States or Department of Education, okay, or Department of Justice. These are high level administrative agencies who then have other sub agencies that report to them, right? Department of Justice has the FBI and, the, and, and others, the Bureau, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, they all report to the Department of Justice. So if, uh, if the state of Arizona says, we're not gonna, we're gonna make it legal for people to possess marijuana here, even for recreational use, okay? But the federal government still has a law that says it's against the law to possess marijuana. So then the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol Tobacco and Firearms, or the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, another part of that, if they say, since the states are allowing this, we are going to choose not to not to pursue this in those states. So they didn't have to pass a law. They didn't have to go to the legislature and get the legislature to vote on it to make marijuana legal. In essence, they just made a rule that said, our agents are not going to go after marijuana. And you're like, wait a minute, can you do that? Or do you need to make a law or change the existing law, right? And so what happens is sometimes these agencies they do things that make people think they're acting be outside of the legislative process. They're creating rules that still impact us like laws. And they're and they're adjudicating those rules. So if if somebody if they make a rule that says you have to do something that says your small business um, can't you can't sell milk, right? Department of Agriculture, you can't sell milk without it being pasteurized. And you're like, but I'm just selling it to my neighbors and they come down on you and they fine you or whatever, if you want to challenge them, can you take them to court? Not really, sort of. You can challenge their ruling in their own court. They have an administrative judge who works for their department. And only after you go there, and if he shuts you down, 
then you can appeal to like the appeals court and the Supreme Court. So judicially, they have power. Legislatively, they have power because they make rules and executive, they can enforce those rules. They'll actually come to your house and be like, you have to stop selling this milk. And if you don't, you're going to be fined or whatever. Okay. So this is what administrative agencies are. So we need to talk a little bit about how they have that authority to do those things, because it seems like it's outside of the normal authority of things. Um, and we have to talk about limitations on their authority. All right. So it says they exist at every level of government, meaning there's state administrative agencies, right? There's an Arizona Department of Education, an Arizona Department of Children and Families, those sorts of things. Um, all right. So here's some examples, Department of Agriculture, Department of the Interior, et cetera. You can read those. I won't read the whole list to you. All right. So they exist for a certain reason, and that is... I want you to think, imagine you're the president of the United States. No, you're the president of our island community. Maybe, I don't know. Remember our island community? So remember we had this whole issue with cabbage and cabbage theft and whatnot. And apparently we purged the cabbage thief from among us because I haven't seen him in a while. Um, but uh, let's say we all get together and say, is it Bethany? Were you the one growing the cabbage? Who was growing the cabbage? Bethany's growing so much cabbage. She doesn't need that much cabbage. We think Bethany should have to uh, should have a cap on the amount of cabbage she can produce, and any additional cabbage should go to the community. Ooh, we're turning into a socialist island, right? Um, so we all get together and we vote on it because we're our own legislature and we agree to it. We're like, okay, this is a new law. She can produce enough cabbage for her to eat and her family to eat, plus enough for her to sell to make a profit, but anything over, I don't know, anything over 200 heads of cabbage a year becomes the property of the community. And she's like, this is BS, and she's challenging it in court. But in the meantime, we have this law. And so our regular police, our regular sheriff, I think that was Wolf Slayer over there, um, our regular sheriff, she's busy dealing with the thieves on the island and things, and she doesn't really have time, nor does she understand the ins and outs of cabbage farming, okay? And so, as the chief executive on the island, she says, I think I need, I need somebody who has a better understanding of, of farming in general to help me enforce these rules. So uh, she takes it to the legislature, which again is everybody in this small setting, but in the US it would be the Congress, right? And says, uh, hey, I need, I need help with this. So they all agree, let's create this agency, the Bureau of Cabbage Control or something. Um, and now this agency uh, can make all these rules about cabbage and kind of enforce them. So that's a little weird in our tiny little island, but think of a, trying to rule over a nation of 350 million people, okay? So now when we say, hey, I think we need a specialty enforcement agency so that, so, so you know, the president of the United States says, here I am tasked with, with ensuring that all of the laws of the United States are, are duly uh, enforced but I've got a really special problem down on the Southern border of the United States where we have hundreds of thousands of people coming across the border kind of unchecked. Can we create an agency whose job it is to oversee the border area and understand the special needs of the communities around the border area? They, so they create um, you know, a, a, a Bureau of Customs Enforcement or something like that, uh, Im Immigration and Customs. And so then, now that group has a specific job. Do you think that they can make rules about how they'll enforce things? Like we have a limited number of agents, so we're gonna try to focus on people who are smuggling drugs, but people who look like they're pretty innocent and just kind of come up and get day work, we're not gonna invest as much energy into or something like that. Yeah, they almost have to because they have limited resources, right? Are we going to put up a big wall or are we not going to put up a big wall? Are we going to put up motion sensors? Are we going to use lethal methods or are we going to use 
non-lethal method, like all of these things, they have to make those decisions. And now, of course, those are coming from above, but at some point, somebody on the ground has to make a decision. And what's hard is if you're that person who's coming across the border and you run into one of these, these border enforcement people, you're kind of at their mercy a lot of times. And so how they choose to execute the laws that have been made can really have an impact on you as an individual, even though the lawmakers are thinking of it more in like broad terms, like how does this impact hundreds of thousands of people? And so that's always what happens with law enforcement and other things is, is we have big laws, but then sooner or later, they come down to a one-on-one -on -one contact, right? And that's where bad things sometimes happen and good things sometimes happen, et cetera. So recognize that administrative agencies fill the role of specialization, meaning helping the government execute the laws, the executive branch execute the laws in specialized areas, okay? That provides for more rapid enforcement. And sometimes they exist to achieve social goals like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Federal Home Loan Bank Board who exists to try to help more people be able to afford to buy a house. In other words, to to loan money to banks so the banks can open up their lending to a broader group of people who maybe wouldn't have qualified before, things like that. Um, so the primary law that allows these agencies to exist is called the APA or the Administrative, Administrative Procedures Act. And in essence, what it did is it set, Congress created this law that said, here is the process by which administrative agencies will be created. And here's the rules that they have to live by. Okay, and that's the APA. And then in 1966, they passed an addition or an amendment to the APA called the Freedom of Information Act, which would allow people, the public, to get access to government records. There's exceptions, of course, for stuff that's like classified for national security purposes and stuff like that. But generally speaking, the idea would be like, if the government is like collecting information on you, you should have a right to request it and see it. Okay, and generally speaking, they follow it unless there's some exception. Then the Federal Privacy Act in 1974, two great things came into the world in 74, me and the Federal Privacy Act. Uh, you can decide which one's better. Um, and this was just to cut out the sharing or exchange of information between agencies. In other words, government agencies can share information under the Privacy Act if there's a reason to but they can't just casually share it. And so related to that, there's like an education and uh, a privacy and education, privacy and healthcare. So like, I am not allowed to share any of your guys' information with other people or with other government agencies without your permission. So like if, and I've had this happen, crazy enough, if your parent called me and was like, I'm really worried about Bethany. Um, she just, you know, can you tell me how she's doing in your class? Do you know what I can say to her? I can't even say, I can't even confirm that Bethany is in any of my classes. I can say, I'm gonna refer you to the records office. And the records office will usually have a form that you either did or didn't fill out. One that says, yes, you can release information to my parents or, or you can't. Like when we have high school kids take care, the, the school requires them to fill out that form saying we can communicate with the school and with the parents and then they sign it, right? Anyway. So that's what the idea behind the Privacy Act. We can't just get each other's records without the consent of that person, or in some cases, a warrant, right? So in some cases, if like, instead of getting a person's consent, if we thought there was crime going on, we may be able to go to a judge and say, can we get their records on the basis of this probable cause? And the judge can make that decision and issue a warrant. So it kind of goes back to that Fifth Amendment, right? You have a right to privacy. And so... This law, the Federal Privacy Act, just codified in statutory law how, how agencies can share information back and forth. A few others, the Government and Sunshine Act, the Federal Register Act, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, these are all kind of additions to, um, to the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, this one cut here, um, the Government and Sunshine Act, if you ever serve like on a school board or some other committee that's that's public entity, you actually need to know these laws because you can get yourself in trouble with the law if you don't follow the rules of the open meeting law. 
So for example, anytime we have a meeting, so any meeting we have here at the college, um, not like a meeting like between teachers, but a meeting that's like a public meeting, like our, our school board or our, our college board of, board of directors, or I'm on like the Arizona Department of Education, I'm on one of their boards of trustees. We have to publish that out there to the world saying, we're gonna hold a meeting on this day. And in the meeting, here's, here's a copy of the agenda. Here's the things we're gonna discuss. If you have any comments that you want brought up at the meeting, you have until this date to like submit that. Um, or you can be at the meeting and, and there'll be time given. So you have to follow all these laws. And again, the intent is so government's not doing shady crap, right? But so that there that people have a chance to be there, hear what's going on and and share stuff. Um, anyway, so that's what those laws are. So here's what administrative agencies do. First thing they do is they make rules. In other words, Congress has made laws pass the president with enforcing the laws. The president has come back and said, I need more specific help in enforcing this law. It's very specific. And so they create an administrative agency to do that. Many, of them, most of them are all created now, right? I mean, every once in a while they can make a new one, but typically that's what it is. So then that administrative agency says, okay, we have these laws that we're tasked with enforcing. How do we go about doing that? How do we make that successful? So they make rules, which are internal rules, which bind the agency, okay? So Congress will pass what's called an enabling act, which creates the agency. And then the agency will research the problem. They'll propose regulations. There'll be a public comment period where people, where they say, we're proposing, we're gonna make these regulations. Does anybody from the public have comment on them? And usually the people who comment are the people impacted by them, right? So if it's the Environmental Protection Agency, the companies that are going to be getting regulated are the ones that are going to be like, this is going to be impossible for us, or we might need more time to do this or whatever. Then the action or rule is taken, and then they adopt it as a rule and, and listen to any challenges to the rule. So there's this whole process they have to go through to make regulations. So think of it like this. The government, the, is, the Congress is going to make a law that says, like, you can't pollute. It's against the law to, to, to dump pollutants into the air. Maybe they'll specify some pollutants. The problem with that, though, is that if some new pollutant pops up, some new chemical we were never using before, is it snowing out there? Uh, is that why you keep peeking out there? <laughs> I notice he's, like, getting all excited when he's peeking out the window. Uh, uh, that's going to hurt my going on a walk this afternoon. It looks miserable. <laughs> yeah, I need to, though. Anyway, so, so the government makes a law that says you can't pollute. So then the Environmental Protection Agency has to be like, well, what does that mean? And, what, and, and, and then they have comments, right? So they're like, you can't put mercury into the air because mercury is harmful to people's health. And they'll have a public comment period and the power plants will be like, we can't completely scrub all mercury out of all emissions. But currently we're able to scrub this percentage of it out. And we think with, you know, with so many years of, of work, we can get down to this. Can we make the rule so that it like steps in, phases in over time? And they have all these discussions and finally come up with the rules to try to be reasonable. Cause we don't, could you imagine if they were just like, no, no mercury. And so the power plants just had to like shut down and then we had no power. That wouldn't make sense. Instead of saying, let's set up a plan to reduce mercury emissions or whatever. So they have to manage all of that. So that's that kind of rulemaking process. So this is the steps that it goes through. This only happens once to create the agency, whereas the agency will make more and more rules after it exists, okay? So they study and research it. They propose it. There's a public comment period. They have regional hearings where people have a chance to come and say, and sometimes it's just regular people, but a lot of times it's representatives of, of the, the industries that are being regulated. Then they modify it. Then there's another public, public comment period on the modification. Then they either withdraw it and say, you know, we're not going to make that regulation or they make it. And then people start to challenge it in court. <laughs> and so this is how government works. 
um, at least at the administrative agency level. Recognize that these administrative agencies, they control pretty much all of your life, at least how you interface with the government. They control the food you can get or not get in the stores. They control you know, what restaurants can serve or not serve. They control whether or not you could carry a gun on you as you walk around. They control the level of, of emissions that are allowed from your car, right? A lot of things that are, you know, they, they, they control the bandwidth and frequency that cell phone communications can use. There's all these different government agencies that have control. And you can see why you would need specific knowledge and expertise in each of those areas. But sometimes to think my whole life's being regulated by people who did who are not people that we elected, that's a little bit scary to people. All right. All right. So if somebody breaks one of their rules, this is the process by which they enforce their rules. Okay. So they have, first of all, they have non-prosecuting actions which involve regulation. Maybe they just come back to you and say, hey, you're breaking the rule. These are the rules. Start following them, okay? Licensing. Did I ask this for anybody in here, cosmetology person that did in high school? Nobody was. In the state of Arizona, you have to be licensed, right? To, to be a cosmetologist, to, to, to hair, nails, whatever they do. So that's one way they limit it, right? By making, or to be a nurse or to be a lot of things. And so you have to go to school and then you have to pass a board exam. And that's a way of controlling to ensure people have at least a basic level of knowledge before they go into that business. Uh, and inspections, county health departments, they're an executive agency of the county government. They go in and make sure that the restaurant isn't completely gross. Anybody ever work in a restaurant? Yeah. Even ones that pass are still kind of gross sometimes, right? Yeah. Like it's hard to make that much food on that scale and not have grossness, at least to an extent. All right. Other times though, if, if, if these don't work, then they'll go to prosecution where they'll actually, you know, in essence say you've broken this rule, come in for a hearing. And in the hearing, you know, you can try to defend yourself and say, here's why we didn't break the rule. Um, but usually out of a hearing comes what's called a consent decree. And a consent decree is a document where you, in essence, say, I agree to stop doing this or start doing this. They say, we agree to not prosecute you further as long as you, can, you stop doing this or start doing this. And everybody agrees to it. And that's the end of it. Um, if you break the consent decree or even sometimes as part of the consent decree, there's penalties and sanctions. Those can include fines. So you have to pay a certain amount. And they're usually crazy, like where the government will come and say, like, you know, for every day that you don't stop doing this, it's going to be $25,000 a day. And so they add up like crazy fast. So there's fines and injunction, which is a legal order to stop doing something or start doing something. Like if, a, if a, you know, if I was using the Disney trademark or, you know, using uh, something like that, they could, they could file for an injunction that would force me to stop using that. Okay, so an injunction is just a court order for specific uh, performance or, 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 or specific stopping of a, of a performance. They could order repayment and they could order in the case of advertising, things like corrective advertising, where you have to publish a thing saying, you know, we, this advertisement we put out was misleading and here's the, here's the real thing or whatever. Um, and then if we don't like the consent decree or the penalties levied, we can appeal the agency action. And usually the appeal process will take us to an administrative judge within the agency first, and they'll rule on it. And if they, if their ruling is still not in line with what we think the law is, we can usually appeal that to the federal uh, court of appeals. And then, if, and then they'll rule on it. And then, of course, we could appeal to the United States Supreme Court. So there's a process in place. But I'll tell you, if you're a business owner and you get caught up in the middle of this, especially let's say you're a, you're a small business owner and like they're mad at you because your bathrooms aren't American with Disabilities Act compliant. And the cost of putting in new bathrooms is going to be 
20 grand and you don't have 20 grand, what's going to cost you even more than the 20 grand of putting in the new bathroom is this prolonged process of this, of, of getting pull, pulled in for a hearing. Usually you have your lawyer with you discussing a consent decree where they're just going to say, sorry, you have to make an ADA compliant bathroom. If you don't, they start to sanction you or penalize you and say, okay, for every day you don't have a compliant bathroom, it's going to be a thousand dollars. Like, so a lot of times most people will just like comply, you know, like, so you'll kind of get away with your non-compliant bathroom until, until the government notices. And then, and just, so you know, there's certain rules about the size of businesses. Not everybody has to have an ADA compliant bathroom, but there's an example. So even though we, we generally think of these things as a positive thing that keep us, you know, keep our society civil and safe, when you're on the, the bad side of one of these, it's really scary stuff because now you have the full force of the government coming down on you to change something. Because um, I, I don't love them, but you know what I do love? I love knowing that when I go to the store and buy food, it's probably not going to kill me. That when I go and buy medication, it's actually had to go through a process of approval where it does what it says it's supposed to do, right? I like that. I like the safety that, that government agencies provide, but sometimes I chafe at the rules being imposed upon me, right? And that's all of us. You know, we like the safe, we like safe roads, but we still want to speed. And so, you know, I shouldn't have to stop at that stop sign. There's nobody coming anyway. I don't know. All right. Here's an issue. Uh, some people consider it an ethical issue. But sometimes these regulations written by the federal government can be almost impossible for people to understand. And so you're kind of at the mercy of the agency that wrote it. So here's an example. The reading level of the general U.S. population. That's actually better than I thought. But on average, the U.S. population reads at about an 11 and a half grade level. Okay. So about like a high school graduate, close to it. You can see the reading level of lawyers is around 19th grade level, whatever that means. But like some things like the Social Security Act, you would need somebody who's at a 41st grade level to read and understand it. In other words, the only people who understand it are lawyers who specifically work with that specific part of the act, right? Like somebody who's made it their whole life to become an expert in that one part. And guess who works for the government agency? That guy, because that's his whole job. The average person or business owner, they don't have time to learn social security law, right? So you're often kind of at their mercy, or mean, which means you have to hire an expensive lawyer who would understand it. Um, and so that, that's frustrating to people. So there are, there are calls for things like in addition to the government and the Sunshine Act, or maybe as an addition to it, there should be some rewriting of U.S regulations and, and codes into some sort of plain English, like at a, at a general, like a 12th grade level or something like that. So that the average person, because probably you felt that already, you've tried to read a contract from your cell phone provider and been like, I can kind of understand it, but like, there's so much there, it starts to all unravel. Um, so, you know, maybe you read at the, maybe you're in your college, maybe you read at the 14th grade level, uh, but they're writing the thing at the 20th grade level and, and they do that on purpose, right? To it gives them an upper hand. We'll talk about that in contract law a little bit more. So that's really it. I just, you know, key takeaways is I need you to know what an administrative agency is. So after, if after this, you're like, I still don't know, then you need to read your book. Okay. Because I did explain it. Um, you should know how they're formed, which is they're formed by the legislature creating a law called an enabling act, which creates the agency and gives it its authority. You need to know how they're limited. They're limited by laws like the Administrative Procedures Act and the Freedom of Information Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act. And then generally recognize that almost any of these agencies whose name you've heard of fall under this. The FBI, the Department of Education, those are all administrative agencies. And so recognize that their influence on how we live is broad. Like every part of our life in some way is impacted by the rules they make. So that's all I have. Nice and early so you can go to church. Uh, uh, and that's it for today. So I hope you have a great day. You better go to church now. Because if you don't, after I cut you out early to go, you're a horrible human. No, no, no.
<laughs> I'm not saying everybody has to. I'm saying the guy who was like, can we get out of church or, or out, out of class early so I can go? Hey, good job by coming in with your thing. You reminded him he needed to go. See? See ya.